the evenings. We have been in the book now for several weeks, quite a few weeks really, and uh, we slowed down our pace considerably last Wednesday evening. And we spent the entire night on chapter 4, verse 1, and I told you then that we would spend another week on chapter 4, verse 1, and so that's what we're going to do tonight. We're talking about the rapture of the church. The book of Revelation, you'll remember chapter 1, verse 19, has a built-in outline. And uh, there are three parts to that outline. The first is the things which you have seen, and John recorded those in chapter 1. The second, the things which are, regarding the church, the church age, chapters 2 and 3. And then the things which shall be hereafter, chapter 4, verse 1 and forward to the end of the book. And so we began that third and final section last week, and I believe that it is at this point in the book of Revelation that we would place the event known as the rapture of the church. Let's read that first verse. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. And uh, just to read the first few words of verse 2, immediately I was in the Spirit. Now, for the benefit of those who may be unfamiliar with these terms, perhaps you haven't been with us before, even on a Wednesday evening, and so you haven't had the benefit of a running start, let's just define a couple of the words that we are using. First of all, we're talking about a period of time known as the tribulation. Typically, when you hear a Christian talk about the tribulation, they're talking about a seven-year period, though it is the last half of that period that we refer to as the Great Tribulation. But there's lots of names in the Bible for the entire seven-year period, and uh, typically we do refer to the whole period as the Tribulation. The Tribulation, as we're going to see, because that's even though we're going to talk tonight about the Rapture, in order to understand some things about the Rapture, we're going to focus on the nature of the Tribulation. So, as we're going to see, the tribulation is a period of time in which God is dealing once again with the nation of Israel, as well as judging the world for its sin, for its rejection of Christ. So, the tribulation. Then we are talking also about the second coming. Now, the second coming of Christ is that event when Jesus will return to the earth. In fact, it is the event that will end the tribulation. And when he returns, he is going to set up his kingdom here on the earth. He's going to introduce the kingdom age. He'll rule from Jerusalem. And this earthly kingdom, the scriptures say, will last for 1,000 years. And so we call that period of time the millennium because of its length, its duration. So the second coming of Christ, it ends the tribulation, Jesus coming back to establish his kingdom. But then there's this event that we talked about so much last week, and again we will tonight, and that is the rapture of the church. Now, the rapture of the church is a doctrine that not every Christian holds. Last week I pointed out that there are some Christians who do not believe in such an event. And uh, I explained that I grew up in a church where that was the case. I grew up in a church where I was specifically told that Hal Lindsey and others like him were liars and that there was no rapture of the church, only a second coming to which to look forward to. And I believe they were wrong. I I don't believe that Hal Lindsey is a liar when he says that this event will take place. And I, too, believe that this event will take place. There's several reasons, a couple of which we mentioned a week ago, that people say there's no such thing as the rapture. One of them is that the word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible. We pointed out that neither does the word Trinity. Yet clearly, most Christians, certainly we would say all true believers, would agree that the concept of the Trinity, that is the triunity of God, that that one God exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we would agree that that concept is taught in the Bible, though the word isn't used. And so, too, the concept of the rapture is taught. Now, whether or not you find the word rapture in your Bible all depends on what translation you're reading. If you're reading in the Latin Vulgate, you will find the word rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. In your New King James Version, it says caught up. In the Latin Vulgate, it says raptured. And so it isn't true, in fact, that the word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible. But another thing that these individuals will say is that 
this is not a biblical doctrine, that it is, in fact, only a very recent development. They will claim that no one taught about this doctrine, about the rapture, until 1830. And they may allow for the concept no earlier than about 1812. Well, there's a number of things that could be said about that, and I won't spend a whole lot of time on it. Men like uh, Tommy Ice, who is from Austin, though he's now on the East Coast, and uh, also Grant Jeffrey have done a real good job of, of documenting much earlier beliefs in the rapture in church history, particularly one particular individual in the 4th century A.D. However, that isn't even the point. It really wouldn't matter to us if no one had believed in it throughout church history if the Bible teaches it. And in fact, it does. And uh, that's what we focused on last week. We focused on the fact that the New Testament clearly teaches about the rapture of the church. Now, some of you are taking notes, some of you aren't. And for those who are, I want to give you several passages that you can write down. And some of these are the ones we looked at last week. But I want to give you those and more that you can look at in your own personal study. These are passages that talk about the rapture of the church. We studied the key ones, the ones that give us the most information last week. But here are those and others. You can jot down John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Try to go slow enough that you can get them, but not so slow that those not taking notes fall asleep. You may have to get the tape and play it back. Romans chapter 8, verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And then chapter 15, verses 51 to 53. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Through chapter 3, verse 2. Now, there are other passages. There are three more that I'll share with you a little bit later on tonight. And then there are several others where it's possible that it refers to the rapture of the church, but it's also possible that it refers to the second coming. The details are such that it could refer to either one, or in some cases, even both. And I felt strongly enough about their possible reference to both or specifically their reference to the second coming that I left them out of the list. But just so you know, there are other potential passages. Now, when you study those passages, as we did in part last week, one of the things that you discover is that there are, if there is one event being described in the New Testament, and that is the second coming, then we have many contradictions regarding what's going to happen in the second coming. That's why it becomes clear as you study that we have two distinct events that are described. And what I want to do is share with you some of the differences between the two. Uh, this particular list, I believe, was put together by Edward E. Hinson. In the rapture, Christ comes for his own. But in the second coming, Christ comes with his own. In the rapture, he comes in the air. And in the second coming, he comes to the earth. In the rapture, he claims his bride, and in the second coming, he comes with his bride. In the rapture, there is the removal of believers, and in the second coming, there is the manifestation of Christ. In the rapture, only his own see him, but in the second coming, every eye shall see him. In the case of the rapture, immediately thereafter, I believe, the tribulation begins, but in the case of the second coming, immediately thereafter, the millennial kingdom begins. Regarding the rapture, the saved are delivered from wrath. Regarding the second coming, the unsaved experience the wrath of God. In the rapture, there are no signs that must precede it. We talked about that last week. But in the second coming, there are very definite signs that precede it. 
In the rapture, the focus is on the Lord and the church. In the second coming, the focus is on Israel and the kingdom. We're going to elaborate on that a bunch tonight. And then in the rapture, the world, or following the rapture, the world is deceived, but at the time of the second coming, Satan is bound. So you have two events that are very, very different uh, in their purpose and in their scope. And uh, the more you study these passages, the more you will see that for yourself. So let's talk just a little bit again about the things we covered last week. Not only for the benefit of those who weren't here, but to give those who were that running start to tonight's message. We saw in the passages we looked at that Jesus made the very first reference in the Bible to the rapture of the church in the John 14 passage. We learned a great deal about the mechanics of the rapture, exactly what happens and in what sequence, though we know it happens in the twinkling of an eye. We saw that in the 1 Thessalonians 4 passage and in the 1 Corinthians 15 passage. And then we saw several pre-tribulational arguments. You see, we not, last week we focused especially on the fact that there is such an event and what that event is all about, what it is, what it looks like, how it happens. But we began talking about what we're going to continue tonight, and that is when does it happen in relationship to this tribulation period? Does it happen before it? Does it happen in the middle of it, as some believe? Does it happen at the end of it, as others believe? And, and so we did see some arguments for why we believe it happens before the tribulation. We learned that the day of the Lord, this technical phrase which includes the tribulation, is preceded by the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 5 passage. We learned that the day of the Lord cannot begin until uh, the Antichrist is revealed, and the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the restraining work of the Holy Spirit through the church is removed at the rapture in the 2 Thessalonians 2 passage. And then also we saw that events that um, describe that which follows the church age here in the book of Revelation take place after the rapture of the church. So looking at Revelation 4.1, that's where your Bible is turned now, um, we'll give you these final points in the way of review. We compared chapter 1 verse 19 to chapter 4 verse 1. Chapter 1 verse 19, that third category, the things which will take place after this in the Greek, metatauta. And then when you get to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, after these things, metatauta, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place, metatauta, after this. And so twice in this verse, we're clued into the fact that that, that corresponds with chapter 1, verse 19. That these things forward are those events that are yet future, and, and maybe most importantly in terms of what we're discussing tonight, they follow the things which are. Chapters 2 and 3, the things that pertain to the church age. Remember that the seven letters to the seven churches found in chapters 2 and 3, among other things, gave us a panoramic view of all of church history. The seventh church especially corresponding with modern times. And so... The things we read about from here on follow all of that. I believe they follow the church age. Remember also, if you'll turn back to chapter 2, we made this interesting point. At the end of the first letter in verse 7, chapter 2, verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Look with me at verse 11, at the end of the second letter. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 17 the end of the third letter. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 29, the end of the fourth letter. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Chapter 3, verse 6, the end of the fifth letter. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 13, the end of the sixth letter. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 22, the end of the seventh letter. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now this phrase recurs one time in the book of Revelation. It recurs one time following where we are placing the rapture of the church in chapter 4, verse 1. And I want you to turn there with me to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 
the ninth verse. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Period. What's missing? Well, what the Spirit says to the churches, right? The church is conspicuous by its absence. In fact, you don't find the word church again after chapter 3 until you get to the last chapter of the book of Revelation. Turn with me to chapter 22. You find the word in the 16th verse. There's only 21 verses in the final chapter. In verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. Now, in fact, as you continue with us in the study of Revelation, you will find that from chapter 4, verse 1, to chapter 19, verse 14, there is not one mention of the church on the earth. As you will see in chapters 4 and 5, and we'll kind of close on this note tonight, you see the church in heaven. But you do not find one mention to the church on the earth until the second coming of Christ. Revelation 19.14, where we are seen coming back with Him. So, these are the things that we talked about last week. Now, we want to pick up on that, and we want to continue by moving forward now. I said earlier that we want to focus on the nature of the tribulation itself. That will go a long way toward helping us to understand where we would place the rapture. So, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles back to Daniel chapter 9. Like last week, you may or may not want to leave your finger in Revelation because it will be a little while before we get back there. Daniel chapter 9. Now, this passage and, and the couple that we'll look at following it are passages that we could spend the whole night on. We won't do that. We'll, we're going to have to you know, really focus in on some very specific things that are pertinent to our discussion tonight. So, Daniel chapter 9. This is one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. And it's a very important one, particularly the verses that we're going to look at now, verses 24 through 27. Let's begin by reading verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Now, in the book of Daniel, Daniel is in captivity. The southern kingdom of Judah had been taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. And so, God said in His Word, this captivity would last for 70 years. Daniel discovered that as he was reading from the Scriptures there in captivity. He began to pray and began to seek the Lord about all of these things. And he wanted to know what God's plan was and what was going to happen and specifically what was going to happen after they had returned to their land as God had promised. And so, after this lengthy and, and very worthwhile reading, by the way, after this lengthy prayer, the answer comes to Daniel. And the answer begins there in that 24th verse. Verse 24 is kind of like an introduction to and a summary of the three verses that follow. Verse 25, 26, 27 give us the answer, but verse 24 summarizes that entire answer. And so we want to zero in on that and we want to focus on that. You'll notice it says that 70 weeks are determined. Now, I think the word weeks is a poor translation. In fact, the word translated weeks simply means sevens. And it's used much like we would use the word dozen. If I made a reference to a dozen of anything, you would know that I meant twelve. But if I referred to a dozen, you wouldn't necessarily know what I was referring to. A dozen of what? A dozen eggs, a dozen donuts, you wouldn't know. Now, here, we also do not know. We know that it's sevens, but is it seven days? Is it seven years? Is it seven seven-year periods? You see, in the Jewish mind, in, in Hebrew culture, it could have been any one of those things. They had a week made up of seven days. But they also had seven years, where they would work the land for six years, and then the seventh year they would give it a rest. So, they not only had one day in seven that was set aside as a day of rest, they had one year in seven, the sabbatical year. 
And then also they had seven sevens of years, or 49 years. That was the period between their year of Jubilee. They'd have a year of Jubilee, and then 49 years, and then have a year of Jubilee. So there's only one way to determine whether Daniel was referring to you know, seven days or seven years or seven seven-year periods, and that would be from the context itself. And as we look at the context of the passage, it would be most reasonable uh, to conclude that it was referring to years. And so we have 70 seven-year periods, 70 weeks of years. We'll make it real simple for you, 490 years. 490 years. So that's the first thing we've learned. God is telling Daniel by way of the angel Gabriel that his prophetic plan for the nation of Israel is a plan that includes 490 years. Now he says this, that they are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now, who would Daniel's people be? That's easy. Daniel's people would be Israel. What would be Daniel's holy city? Well, that's easy too. That would be the city of Jerusalem. And so right away, we're clued into the fact that this prophecy does not concern the world. This prophecy does not concern the church. This prophecy concerns the nation of Israel. Any other details that are given here are incidental. It is very much a Jewish prophecy. It has to do with God's 490-year plan for the Jewish people. Now, it's worth pointing out also that the number seven in the Bible is the number of completion. So this prophecy deals with the completion of God's plan for Israel. Now, notice what else the verse says. It actually gives us six specific things that this 490-year period are about. And as we're going to see, there's still seven years left in this 490-year plan. So this tells us not only what those years that have already expired were about, but it tells us what those coming seven years, you guessed it, the tribulation are about. They're about these six things. Number one, to finish the transgression. Let me try to just share a little bit about each one of these things. This would indicate that Israel's rebellion against God and their rejection of the Messiah will be finished at the second coming and that it will not continue beyond that time. Then the second purpose, to make an end of sins, which may refer to God taking away Israel's sins, which really is alluded to in the next purpose, or to God judging Israel's sin. The third purpose, to make reconciliation for iniquity. This has to do with the fact that God's provision for the sins of the whole world will be appropriated by Israel at the second coming. The fourth purpose, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Another way to translate that would be to bring in the age of righteousness. That would be a reference to the millennium. Remember, we talked about the millennium in our introduction. It's that thousand-year kingdom uh, that will follow the second coming. The fifth purpose is to seal up vision and prophecy. At this point in time, all of the prophecies concerning God's plan for Israel will be fulfilled. And then the sixth purpose, to anoint the most holy, which may refer to the holy place in the millennial temple. You see, the Bible tells us that during the millennium there will be a temple. And so perhaps the anointing of the holy place in that temple. Or, and I like this better, it may refer to the anointing of Jesus Christ. In other words, the Father anointing him for that millennial reign. And so, again, so that you don't miss it, those six things that the 490 years are about, that the tribulation, which has yet to take place, is about, has everything to do with the nation of Israel and absolutely nothing to do with you or with me or with the church. It has to do with the nation of Israel. Now, as we look at the verses that follow, that's the introduction and the summary, but as we look at verses 25, 26, and 27, I want you to understand what is there, and then we'll pick them apart. In verse 25, we have the first 69 seven-year periods. Remember, there are 70 seven-year periods. But in verse 25, we get the first 69 of them. In other words, 483 of the 490 years. 
all but seven of the years of God's plan for Israel. Then in verse 27, I'm jumping a verse. In verse 27, we get information about that last seven-year period. Years 484 through 490. The last seven-year period. In verse 26, the verse in the middle, we get events that take place between the first 69 sevens, or the first 483 years, and the last seven, the last seven years. And so let's look at verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. Now, what would be important to us would be to discover when such a command was given, because that would be the time when God's stopwatch, which is prepared to tick off 490 years, that would be the time when it began ticking for the first 483 of those 490 years. There were four decrees along these lines, beginning with Cyrus in 538 B.C. Four decrees, that is, that dealt with the city of Jerusalem. But only the fourth and final of those decrees, which was executed by Artaxerxes on March 5, 444 B.C., was in regard to the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. So we can say then that on March 5, 444 B.C., God punched the button on his stopwatch. And this 483-year period began. Now, I want you to notice in this 25th verse that there is something else interesting that happens here. The 69 sevens are broken down in the middle of the verse. It says, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So it breaks it down between seven of those sevens and, and then 62 of those sevens. What's that all about? Well, we're talking then about these 483 years, some difference between the first 49 and then the 434 that follow. Well, it's thought to have taken 49 years to have removed all of the uh, debris in Jerusalem and then to complete the rebuilding. Remember that Jerusalem had been basically uninhabited. It had been desolate for 70 years. And so that it took this length of time to clear the debris and to complete the rebuilding. And then it talks about Messiah the Prince in verse 25. I believe this is a reference to Jesus Christ. Now in Daniel chapter, or verse in the 26th verse, it says, After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail about this tonight, but I am going to recount it to you. And I'm going to encourage you, if, if it's not something you've studied before and you'd like to know more about it, to look into it. But there are two individuals who have done an excellent job, uh, Sir Robert Anderson being one of them, of documenting the fact that if you begin with the date March 5th, 444 B.C., and you add 483 years to it, the Jewish calendar being based on a 360-day year. You know, we uh, have the leap years where we add the extra day. They wouldn't do that. Every so often they would add a 13th month. They had a different way of handling it. Take a, so if you take 483 years times a 360-day calendar, you get uh, the number of days that will take you from the beginning of that prophecy to the time when Messiah, the Prince, should be cut off. And uh, I want to tell you specifically where you can get some of this information and a little bit more about it. But 173,880 days from the time that command was given brings us to the date in history that we know as Palm Sunday, when Jesus Christ rode into the city of Jerusalem, when he was acknowledged by the people as the Messiah. And that being on a Sunday, if Jesus was crucified on Friday, as we traditionally observe, or on Wednesday, as some make a pretty good argument for, either way, just as the prophecy indicates, 483 years later, 
the Messiah was cut off. In fact, cut off translates a word, the word which was used to refer to capital punishment, to execution. So this prophecy was fulfilled to the day. This is one of the amazing prophecies of the Bible. And so if you want to check out Sir Robert Anderson's book, you can read uh, The Coming Prince and you can read Daniel and the Critic's Den. And then also the book Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell documents the research that another individual has done, not Josh McDowell himself, but another individual whose name escapes me at the moment. But the book Evidence That Demands a Verdict, you can find the same information there. It makes for a very, very interesting study. Now, the thing about this verse is that it gives us even more information than that. Because it tells us, not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. We have a description here of the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, the prince who is to come, I believe, is a reference to the Antichrist. I believe the Antichrist is the prince who is to come. The Antichrist is going to be the final ruler of a revived or a renewed, if you prefer, Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire, which arguably, at least in some ways, never ceased to exist, will be renewed or, or revived in the last times. And I think we see that today. We're going to talk about that in weeks to come. But the Antichrist will be the final ruler so of the Roman Empire. So then when it talks about uh, his people, it would be the people of Rome. In 70 AD, it was Titus who led the Roman troops in the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Titus destroyed the city and thousands of Jewish people were killed. Jesus had spoken about this event and Jesus had indicated that when it took place, not one stone would be left standing upon another uh, there at the site of the temple. And you know what happened was that at the time of the destruction in 70 A.D., the Roman soldiers set the temple on fire. And as a result, the gold that covered the walls melted and went into the cracks between the enormous stones that were used to construct the temple. And in order for them to get all the gold out from between those stones, they had to dismantle what remained of it Brick by brick. I mean, exactly what Jesus said. Not one stone was left standing upon another. Now today, you can go to Jerusalem. Some of you are going with me in March. We're going to take you to the Wailing Wall. But you have to understand that the Wailing Wall is not part of the temple. It's part of the wall that surrounds the temple precincts. In regard to the temple itself, not one stone was left standing upon another. The first time I went to, to uh, Israel, to Jerusalem... Uh, the work continues, and so you don't see it quite the same way each time you go. But, you know, right outside of that wall, the Wailing Wall, you know, they're still doing excavations. And I can remember seeing the pile, these piles of great big stones and thinking about not one stone left standing upon another. And again, a remarkable fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Well, notice then, I said that verse 26, verse 25 contained things pertaining to 483 years. Verse 27, things pertaining to the last seven years. I said that verse 26 describes events that happened between them. And it does. The crucifixion, which of course immediately followed the end of the 483 years. And then the destruction of Jerusalem, which followed some four decades later. But now as we continue, I want to make a point, And that is that the implication here is that there is an interval there is an interval between the 483rd year and the 484th year. The Old Testament knows nothing about the church, the bride of Christ, where the father is, is taking a bride for his son made up of people from all over the world. It knows nothing about that. That's why in the New Testament it's called a mystery. Before it was hidden, in the New Testament it's revealed. So, I would not suggest that this suggested to its original readers the church age, but it did suggest to them an interval that we now have the advantage of knowing is the period of time in which the church age takes place. It's the period of time in which we live today. We live in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, though I believe we live right at the end of it. 
And I believe that that final seven-year period is only right around the corner. Now, verse 27 tells us a little bit about that last seven-year period, which we are going to spend weeks studying in the book of Revelation. It says, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, seven years. But in the middle of the week, or the seven years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So this refers to this last seven-year period. It's yet future for us. It is that period that we are talking about when we talk about the tribulation. I believe that it begins after and not with the rapture of the church. In other words, the rapture of the church is not the event that begins the seven years. We often make the mistake of thinking that. In fact, it is the Antichrist, according to this verse, signing, I'll talk about that in a minute, but signing a seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel. That's the event that begins the seven years. How much time will elapse between the rapture of the church and the signing of that covenant? I don't know. I personally don't believe it's going to be a whole lot of time. I think it'll be a relatively short period of time, but we don't know exactly how long it will be. The rapture will be the climax, however, of the church age. The tribulation, as we saw in our introduction, ends with the second coming of Christ, which is really only alluded to in this verse. Now, who is the covenant maker? I've already answered that question, but the way to determine who is the person that makes this covenant with Israel is to determine who is the antecedent of the word he. Verse 27 says, Then he shall confirm a covenant. The antecedent of he in verse 27 is the prince who is to come in verse 26, who we've identified already as the Antichrist. So apparently the seven-year agreement will be a peace covenant. Now, some interesting observations about this verse before we move on. First of all, this verse requires that Israel be in her land. If Israel does not exist as a nation, and if she does not have possession of her land, these things can't happen. For 19 centuries, Israel did not have possession of her land. Never before, in this manner, had a nation been reborn from the past. But on May 14, 1948, Israel was reborn as a nation. This is the year they celebrate 50 years as a nation. Also, this verse requires that that Israel regain control of Jerusalem. It talks here about uh, a temple. We'll see that next. So they would have to have control of the city of Jerusalem, and they hadn't had that uh, for 19 centuries. When they became a nation again on May 14, 1948, they did not have the city of Jerusalem. And so it was not until the Six-Day War in June of 1967 that they took full control of the city. And then also this verse requires that Israel rebuild the temple in order for the Antichrist to interrupt the sacrifices that are being offered there, they've got to rebuild it since it's not standing now. And I can't even begin to share the things with you tonight that are going on in that regard. There's so much. But there is absolutely no question that there are those in Israel who not only desire to rebuild the temple, but who have been preparing to do so for many years. And again, those of, us, those of you that travel with us in March, we will go to the Temple Institute in Jerusalem where you will see with your own eyes some of the uh, implements and various furnishings that have already been made to Old Testament specs for the new temple. On one of the occasions when I was there, they, they always do a question and answer period, and on one of the occasions I was there, someone asked a question. In the question, they said, if you rebuild the temple... The young lady that was answering the questions was very quick to clarify. She said, not if, when we rebuild the temple. For every Christian that hears a Jew talk that way, there's a chill, you know, that runs up and down the spine. It's a good chill. It's a chill of, man, the Lord's coming back, you know. And so they are going to rebuild the temple. In fact, there was a, I don't have the information here in front of me, but I, I do remember that just several years ago there was a full-page ad taken out in one of the major national newspapers that was speaking of the plans to rebuild the temple, asking for engineers and various experts to be a part of that. 
and saying at the bottom that they were not asking for contributions that it's already paid for. Pretty interesting stuff. If you want to know what paper that was and all, you can holler at us at the office and I'll dig that up for you. Well, in Matthew chapter 24, which we're going to look at in a moment, it talks about this event called the abomination of desolation. I'm not even going to say that much about it tonight because we're going to study it when we get to Revelation chapter 13. But you have the tribulation seven years long, right in the middle. In other words, three and a half years in, three and a half years out from the second coming. This event takes place, the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist, false prophet, desecrate the temple. It's a big mess. We're going to learn all about it. But that's the event that it's talking about right here. Now, what I want you to do then is, as I'm kind of, you know, concluding what we've said about Daniel 9, I want you to turn to Matthew 24. Our study of those verses should do a number of things for you. First of all, it should help you to understand that just as God has fulfilled a couple of prophecies we talked about to the most minute detail, so too everything that is yet future will be fulfilled to the most minute detail, including the rapture of the church, including the second coming of Christ and all those other things. But also it emphasizes for us the Jewishness of the tribulation. Does anybody remember hearing anything about the church in that description of those last seven years? No, it was all about Israel. It was all about God's working with the nation of Israel. So now in Matthew chapter 24, you know, again, one of the great chapters of the Bible. We spent eight weeks in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, put it together into a a tape series. There's so much here that I won't even be able to do it any justice at all tonight. So I just want to make a few very simple, very basic points uh, from this passage. I want you to notice with me, uh, verses 1 and 2 talk about the destruction of the temple. I referred to it before. But in verse 3 it says, Now as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So the disciples asked three questions. The first of which uh, is not answered By Matthew. In other words, Matthew doesn't record Jesus' answer. Luke does. But Matthew does record the answers to questions 2 and 3. But let's try to understand the questions. The first question they asked was, tell us when will these things be? What things? The destruction of the temple, spoken about in verse 2. And then the second question is, and what will be the sign of your coming? Well, they don't understand the rapture of the church. In fact, it's, you know something that we saw Jesus doesn't reveal until that night that he's arrested. And so they're talking not about the rapture, but they're talking about the second coming of Christ. And then the third question is, what will be the, or excuse me, end of the end of the age? So what will be the sign of the end of the age? When they're talking about the end of the age, they're not talking about the end of the church age. They don't even understand the church. They're talking about when will this age give way to the next What they're thinking of as the next age is Jesus setting up his kingdom. Lots of verses that we could give, and it would only take a moment's reflection if you're familiar with the New Testament to realize that that Jesus was always having to deal with the fact that the disciples fully expected him to set up his kingdom right then and there. And in fact, that was something that was going to be yet future. So the point is this, that these questions are very, very important. Jewish. These are not church questions. These are not Christian questions. They're Jewish questions. They have everything to do with the nation of Israel. Nothing at all to do with the church. And Jesus' answers are very much Jewish answers. They have to do not with the church, but with the Jewish people. We as Christians learn a great deal from this because there are all these signs about the second coming and about the end of the age And uh, if we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, we know that the rapture is seven years closer than the second coming is. So if you study this chapter and you see all these signs that the second coming is about to happen, and the rapture is going to happen seven years before it does, well, you better get ready, because the Lord's coming back soon. And so I'm not saying there's no benefit to us, but I'm trying to emphasize again the Jewishness of the chapter. Let me draw your attention to a couple things that ought to make that really, really apparent. By the time you get to verse 15, Jesus is no longer dealing with these general signs that he says will increase in frequency and in intensity. 
but he begins to describe the great tribulation. So he's talking about that final seven years, but specifically about the last three and a half. Because in verse 15, he begins by talking about the event that marks the very middle of the tribulation, the abomination of desolation. Verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then apparently Matthew adds, though it could have been Jesus, whoever reads, let him understand. And he continues. So verse 15, the abomination of desolation has to do with the temple, the desecration of the temple, the, the uh, cessation of the offerings that, that are being made there. But notice also the reference to Daniel the prophet. The reference is to the prophecy we just looked at in Daniel 9 as well as another one in Daniel chapter 11, both of which have to do with the nation of Israel. What else clues us into the Jewishness of Jesus' answers? Well, verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Well, how many of you are planning to be in Judea? I mean, some of you are going to visit with me in March. Are any of you planning to get a flat in the old city while we're there? Probably not. I've got to tell you, there are some Christians in Judea, but there aren't a whole lot of them. Jesus is very specifically talking here about the Jewish people. Now look with me at verse 20 as he's talking about the fact that they need to get out of Dodge when the abomination of desolation takes place. Look at what he says. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Now let me ask you a question. If you had to get out of town quick on a Saturday, would that be a problem for you by virtue of its being Saturday? Of course not. You'd hit Diamond Shamrock, fill up the tank, grab a great big soda and hit the road. But if you're a Jewish person, you've got a problem. Because the Jewish people observing the Sabbath and, and following the Old Testament laws in regard to the Sabbath, they're not supposed to travel more than a mile from their home. It's going to be kind of hard to, to flee and to be a fugitive on a Saturday, on the Shabbat. So who is Jesus talking to when he says, pray that your flight is not on the Sabbath day? He's not talking to the church. He's not talking to Gentiles. He's talking to the Jewish people. Well, there is an objection that is sometimes made based on verse 22. You see the description of the tribulation continues to verse 28. You get the second coming beginning of verse 29. Verse 22, Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And so some will say, see there, you know, the elect, the church, they're in the tribulation, not so. In fact, a study of all of the Bible will show that the word elect doesn't always refer to Christians. In fact, the word elect refers to believers of that program with which God is then dealing. During the Jewish age, the elect are Jews. During the church age, the elect are Christians. Which age is Jesus talking about here? Well, he's talking about that seven years that's part of that 490-year program for who? For you? For me? No. For the Jewish people. He's talking about a Jewish age. To whom does the elect refer? It refers to Jews. So what I'm hoping that Daniel 9 and Matthew 24 have done for you is to help you to understand the tribulation is about God once again dealing with the nation of Israel. He started his watch, 444 B.C., He stopped his watch the day that Jesus was presented as the Messiah and that watch has remained stopped. Israel is God's timepiece. Shortly after the rapture of the church when the Antichrist is revealed due to the removal of the Holy Spirit's restraining work through the church in the rapture, the Antichrist will sign the seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel. Thus will begin years 484 through 490 bringing to a completion God's plan for the nation of Israel. So that's what it's about. It's about His plan for them, for the Jewish people, for God's chosen people. Now, there are several things that we want to talk about before we wrap up. You can see why we had to spend two weeks on this. I'll be lucky to get part two done in six or seven minutes when I'm supposed to. Part three. We could do a part three, but we better go ahead and try to wrap it up. I want you to consider several things in closing. I want you to consider this first. Sometimes people say, you know, Christians experience tribulation. So, why would you suppose that God would spare the church from this time of tribulation? 
Well, it's true, Jesus said, in the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. What you have to understand is there is a big difference between tribulation and the tribulation. Tribulation is a general word that refers to difficulty and hardship. The tribulation is a technical term that refers to a very specific period of time, which we've just learned a great deal about. And so there are two very distinct things in the Bible that are referred to with that word. Now, I think that sometimes people who make that point make another point. And I want to be gentle in saying this, but I think it needs to be said. I've heard it too many times. Sometimes those who make that point will then accuse those of us who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of pride and arrogance. They will characterize our belief that while so many died martyrs' deaths, you know, they'll, they'll talk about Fox's Book of Martyrs or even all those who've given their lives for Christ during the 20th century. Some say more than all the previous centuries combined that it shows a great deal of arrogance on our part to think that God would spare us from the tribulation. I need to tell you something. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture and it doesn't make me feel proud at all. It makes me feel extremely humbled that God would spare me from that time. And, here's where I want to be gentle, what I have observed is a great deal of arrogance and pride in those who boast of their readiness and their willingness to endure the tribulation for Christ. I'm going to do it, you know. You guys are wimps and you're proud thinking God's going to take you out. But we're the real church. We're the tough ones. We're the ones that are ready to do this. Hey, man, check your heart. Make sure that there isn't arrogance and pride in your heart as you propose such a thing. Now, also, I am not saying that these things teach a pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? Everybody caught that. The, what I'm about to say. I'm not saying that what I'm about to say teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. In fact, I'm pretty strict about this definition of, of something in the Bible. Uh, you know, um, we, we refer to it as a type. We see something in the Old Testament that reminds us of something in the New Testament. We say, well, this is a type of that. Technically, it's not a type unless the New Testament says so. Unless the New Testament says that is a type of this, uh, then it's not. So, these things are not called types in the New Testament. Jesus did say that the last days would be like the days of Noah, though he explained what he meant by that. He explained that what he meant was that just as nobody believed the flood was going to come, nobody's going to believe that the second coming is going to come. But here's what I want to say then about that time. As we think about the flood, and we think about the ark, and we think about Noah and his immediate family, and we think about those who died, and as we think about the man Enoch. In the Bible, we learn that Enoch never died, that he was taken up from the earth, that he was translated, if you will, to use New Testament terminology. And in fact, as you study the chronology, you find out that that didn't happen so long before the flood. So when you look at the flood, you see three categories of people. You see those who perished in the flood. You see those like Noah and his family who were preserved in the flood. And you see those who were removed before the flood began. It's interesting. It doesn't teach a pre-trib rapture, but it sure is interesting, especially when you take it into account with all the other things that we've talked about. And then there's Abraham and Lot. In the book of Genesis, God revealed to Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham asked a very interesting question. He, he, he talked about the fact that it wouldn't be consistent with the character of God if God were to allow the righteous to perish with the wicked. Because this was specifically coming from God. This was not just you know, some general type of a calamity. This was coming from God as the things will be in the tribulation. And, and so Abraham said, God, that's just not consistent with who you are. Based on everything I know about you, based on everything you've revealed about yourself, that just doesn't add up. And he asks the question, shall not the judge of all the earth do right or do justly? God doesn't correct Abraham. God doesn't say that Abraham was wrong. In fact, Abraham and God strike a deal that if there's X number of righteous people there, he'll spare the whole city. Well, there weren't. And he didn't spare the city, but he did still spare Lot and a couple members of his family. So am I saying that teaches a pre-tribulation rapture? No. It's just interesting, especially when you add it up with all that other stuff. 
Then there's the whole point about the, tribula- or the rapture of the church being the blessed hope. Now, I don't remember who it was. Was it John Walford or somebody else that pointed out that, you know, basically uh, being around when the mountains are sinking into the sea and when mountains are coming up out of nowhere and when 120-pound hailstones are falling on people and when death takes a holiday and when demons are stinging people and... You know, when Christians can't buy or sell because they won't take the mark and so they're going to have their heads chopped off. And, you know, even if they manage to hide somewhere, they'd be starving to death and eating out of trash cans. And that really is a blessed hope, isn't it? Doesn't that bless your heart tonight? Give me a break, man. That's not a blessed hope. That's a bummer. So it doesn't make sense. And, and the Scriptures tell me, as, as one of you reminded me last week, that the church is the bride of Christ. Now, I don't know how you guys treat your bride, but I know that I treat Andrea a little bit differently than what the Bible talks about during the tribulation period. If the way you treat your wife is what we read about in the tribulation, be sure to be here Sunday morning, will you? Because Colossians 3, 4, 9, or 3.19, 4.19, where are we? We're in 3.19. But you know. You know. So, we're the bride of Christ, man. He's got great plans for us. In fact, during those seven years, he's not planning on us down here bummed out. He's planning on us being in heaven, getting hitched. It's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's like Terry Clark said Sunday night, we're going to eat for seven years. I can't wait. You've eaten until you can't stand up before, but seven years? You've eaten until you couldn't roll over in bed. But seven years. And so God's got these great things in mind. We're going to receive rewards and have this great feast and it's going to be a wonderful time for us in heaven. We'll be looking at it in in coming Wednesday evenings. Finally, I just want to make this point. You can turn back to Revelation now if you would. Revelation chapter 4. We'll close with this. Verse 